the game. So everyone is all done. Excellent. All right, let's just let's just go and enjoy the nice weather. All right. Questions? I can, of course, treat your questions individually if if you want to email them to me, or um, we can discuss after class during during the the lab time if you have questions. Nothing. Okay. Does there need to be more classes than the ones that we've talked about? Um, let's refresh our memory about the classes that we've talked about. All right. Um, we have talked about having a card class, a deck class, a player class, which could include the dealer, or there could be a separate dealer class. So you could do this a couple different ways. We've talked about maybe there being a hand class, or maybe that just being part of this class. And then finally we talked about a rules class that would enforce the rules of blackjack. Um, this is irrespective of anything you need on the GUI side. All right. With the GUI, of course, you need the activity and then the associated files. I don't think there's anything that you need beyond that. Could you add something to it? Yeah, maybe, maybe you know, you could take this a different direction. Um, and, and possibly add something to that. But I don't think you absolutely need that. Um, I would say minimally, I see four classes here. Card deck, a player of some sort that you could maybe control whether it's an automated player or a um, human player. And then the rules. The hand or the dealer class um, you could have or you could not have. So, you might think of other things, but that's basically it. Okay. 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 Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, you, you know, and I mean that. What what you described is not atypical. Um, a, a lot of times, you know, as you're writing it, you know, you don't always put things where they belong. And uh, <laughs> right, you know, I, I did I didn't intend that to be funny, but I, I guess it is. You know, it's like my car keys. I don't always put them where they belong, and then I can't find them. Right. Uh, but you don't always put things in their appropriate place or where they belong. And typically, typically the, the general issue you, a lot of times is you put stuff in the GUI that doesn't belong in the GUI. And I'm sure if you looked at my code, you'd see that. And depending on how much it was refactored, um, you know, it, it, it may be to a lesser or a greater degree. Um, the assignment um, that is due next Friday involves when you get the game working, get the game working by hook or by crook. You know, cheat if you have to. <laughs> you know, do what you, I, did I say that out loud? Uh, do what you need to to get it to work. And then the next step, I want you to, to, and we'll spend some class time with it, talk it over with other people, talk it over with me, and see how you can refactor it to have a new and improved version. So that that is, you know, that is by all means a possibility. Now, in the real world, the unfortunate 
truth is sometimes because of like deadlines and practical concerns, you know, you got to push something that isn't ready yet to go out. Um, but in the classroom, we can make allowances for that, and, and we can give an opportunity to refactor it and, and so on. Uh, there's an example we may look at today, depending on how many questions you have, that I honestly don't remember how good it is. <laughs> I mean, it works, but I don't rem remember how good it is from a refactoring perspective. If it needs a lot of refactoring, a little refactoring, or maybe, maybe none at all. I don't know. I kind of doubt that. Um, but we'll, we'll take a look at it and we'll discuss it, because I think even if it does need some refactoring, I think there's some things that we could learn from it. Other questions, comments? Were you raising your hand, Mark? Well, you should, you should know at least if you were raising your hand. You might not be able to phrase your question. Oh, go ahead. There are no videos currently for my Android class because I have it, it has only been offered as a independent study. Didn't say that. <laughs> I said I've never taught it in the classroom. All right, which means that there's no opportunity for videos. It has only been offered as an independent study. If it were to run in spring, it would be taught in the classroom. And I would record the videos just like I would record the videos for any of my classes. So, yep. But again, I, the, the, you know, I, I guess, I, I guess, um, depending on your question, is are there any videos or will there be any videos? Are there any videos? No, there isn't because I've only taught it as an independent study. Will there be videos? Yes. If I teach it in a classroom lecture, there will be videos for it. Yes, yeah, you're, you're, you're totally misunderstanding the whole concept of me offering it as an independent study. Uh, in the past years, if only one student show, uh, registered for the class, they're not going to pay me to come in and lecture to one student, all right? It's, this is the bottom line, all right? You know, let, let's, <laughs> let's get real here. That's the thing. They're not going to pay me to do that. If they did that, I'd lecture, to, I'd lecture to an empty room if they paid me to do it, all right? But they're not going to pay me to, to lecture for that. But yet a student still wanted it, to complete it, to finish up their degree, or, or for other reasons, right? So we try to have a compromise then. And the compromise is, is in the past, is I've gotten paid less to offer it as an independent study, which means that I help the student, the onus is a little bit more on them to be proactive, and I, I can, we talk about what the requirements are and so on, but it's less structured than a, a formal class. Now, that's not how I'll offer it if it's offered in the classroom. If it's offered in a classroom, it will be a class just like this. All right? Uh, you know, <laughs> which, which either makes you say yay or might, might scare you. But it will be a class just like this. Other questions, comments? Did I talk about the player and dealer class last Thursday? I honestly don't remember, but we could talk. Um, okay. Okay. Well, we, we actually talked about that. And, and we said that you could probably have a hand class or a player class. You probably don't need both, but you could have both. Um, the, the thought of for a player class, what you do is a player class might have a person's name in it in addition to the cards that they hold. A player class might have how many chips they had in addition to the cards that they had. So for, as far as playing one hand goes, there really isn't any difference. Uh, a player class might have logic in it. Well, that could be in the player or that could be in the rules class, the logic of a dealer hitting on 17 or less than 17, staying on 17 and higher. So, yeah, there probably would be. Um, what we kind of said is that it would be something like this. Let's say you have a hand class. Or a player class. 
is going to have an array list of cards. And it's going to have an array list of cards called my cards or whatever. There's going to be an add card method that's going to accept a card as an argument and add it to the array list. Probably not return anything. Then there will be in some shape or form, and you could do this a number of different ways, you could have a get cards that returns an array list of cards. Then in your rules class, you're probably going to have a score hand method that, ex that accepts as an argument an array list of cards and returns an integer saying what the score is. So yeah, you wouldn't really need a player class. Uh, a player class is something that is a place to put some other stuff in addition to their card cell. It's almost like if all it is is the cards, then I would call it a hand class. If it has like name and how many chips and all that, then I'd call it the player class, even though it really does the same thing. Other questions? All right. No questions? Let's talk about tic-tac-toe for playing games. All right. Tic-tac-toe, pretty simple game. All right. Now. What do we know about tic-tac-toe? Two-player game, all right. It's impossible to lose if you know how to play, all right. And it's impossible to lose um, if you know how to play. Do you want to go first or second in tic-tac-toe? You want to go first. If you go first and you make a move, what should your move be? The middle. All right. What happens then? The player, the second player, can choose either alongside the center or diagonal to the center. If they choose one of them, unless someone messes up, the game's going to be a tie. If they choose the other one, then the first player is going to win. Let me show you what I mean. Let's play some tic-tac-toe. Now again, nice thing about this is you might think there's like nine squares here. There's really not. Because these squares are all kind of the same, these squares are kind of all the same, and the center's the same. So if x goes first, I put the X here. All right. If the person goes here, they have already lost. Okay. Why is that? Because where should I go then? I should go here. Because then, if they go anywhere else but there, they've lost. If they go here, though, then I go here. In which case, if they block it here, I go there. If they block it there, I go here. All right, so if you're writing a computer game for tic-tac-toe and you're going first, you can program it so that you never lose. All right? How much fun is a game like that? 
not very fun. And chances are, think about it, who is going to be playing tic-tac-toe anyhow for any length of time? Probably a kid, all right? So what might you do to make the game a little more exciting even for a kid? Because a kid, if they lose or draw every time, it's not going to be fun for them. What could you do? Pardon me? You could make the game bigger. You could, you could change the game. Then it wouldn't really be tic-tac-toe. It would be something else. <laughs> All right? So that's one option. But you said? You could make the computer make the choices at random. All right? And that would work, right? Because then the computer would make the choice only some of the time. Is there a compromise between making the computer always make the right choice and the computer always making a random choice. Okay. Okay. You could somehow sometimes make the best move, sometimes take a random move. And you could actually fine tune that, right? You could add sort of like a difficulty level. All right? So if the difficulty level was 10, the computer would always make the right move. If the difficulty level was zero, then it would always take the random move. So and you could slide it then. All right? So that would be a nice way in a game simple as this to sort of configure it. So you have a real little kid that doesn't know anything about it. You put the difficulty down and the computer's just guessing at spots just like the player, just like the kid that's guessing. You have a kid who's a little smarter than that, you bump the difficulty up. So they're not going to lose every time, or they're not going to lose or draw every time, but is most of the time going to make the right, right move. So I thought this was a good exercise because, again, it's simple, you know. At my tac toe game is what? Five moves? You know, five moves for the first person, four moves for the second person. So there's a finite. And again, fi you know, finite's the wrong choice of words because there's finite moves in chess, right? It just, there's a lot of them. There's only a handful of moves in tic-tac-toe, so it's pretty easy to program. And plus, we can play with some user interface things, all right? Because, let's think about the user interface. We start out with a blank thing. And by the way, to play through the other scenario, if I put my X here, they put the O here, then the game is on, right? Because if I go something like this, they're going to block me, and then, then my hand is dictated and so on so again if you know if you're playing second play the corner one of the corners and you 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 should if you play evenly if, if you don't make any bad moves from there you should draw if you in tic-tac-toe if you play the one alongside of it instead of a corner if the other person plays correctly you should lose all right so some rules about the GUI of tic-tac-toe. A place can either be an X or an O, right? Or it can be empty. That's your three choices. When you start out, the grid is empty. If I touch a space, then what does it turn into? An X or an O, depending on whose turn it is. So if it's X's turn to go and I touch here, it turns into an X. If it's O's turn and I touch it again, it turns into an O. What's another rule for the spots? The, the, the boxes in here besides that. You can only have one value. So in other words, once it's an X, it's an X for the whole game. You can't click on it and flip it from an X to an O. So if you were writing a game for this, you were writing the 
the logic for this. How would you go about it? Well, first thing I would do is I would, again, since this is a simple enough game, I would try to exhaustively play out the possibilities. Keeping in mind that there really aren't as many possibilities as you might think because of the symmetry of the board. In other words, this position is the same thing as this position. All right? And it's the same thing as that position, and it's the same thing as that position. All right? Likewise, this is the same as this, or this, or this. So, if I pick the center, you could say that the player has eight choices, but in reality, the other player only has two choices. They can either play next to my X, or they can play diagonal to my X. All right? So, knowing something about the game board, knowing something about the symmetry of it, you can come up with a game tree. All right? What in general would be your rules for the player, uh, the computer player? Number one, you would have the optimal move, and number two, you'd have the random move. The random move is simply going to put it in one of the empty spots. All right, that's, that's straightforward. You'd look to see if a, if a spot has been chosen. If it has not been chosen, then you pick it. For the other one, it would be very easy to write a little algorithm to do that. In other words, if I'm making my best move and I go first, the answer is pick the center. No if, ands, or buts. All right? Then we can go through and write a um, algorithm from there. Let's consider if I pick the center and they pick this, I want to go in one of two places. I want to go here or I want to go there. Really though, those are effectively, I need a mirror to do that, all right? But those are effectively the same move. There and there, it was effectively the same move, just rotated or mirror image flipped or whatever. Because then that forces them to block me. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to go there. Try this again. If I pick the center, they pick here. Yeah, really. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. This isn't the one that leads to doom. This is the game that leads to doom. So if they pick here, then I want to go next to it, all right, so they have to block me here, and then I go here, all right. So if they play alongside of me, I want to go next to them and go on the offense. If they block that, then I can make this play, and I can win one of two directions. All right, let's look at the code here. And again, I have to admit, I, I don't know at what stage of refactoring this code. No. No, I'll post this. This is something I wrote. I actually was not feeling well today, and I was debating calling off. Um, but I took a nap, and I feel a lot better. But then when I woke up from my nap, I looked at the clock and said, I got to get going to class. 
all right? And therefore, I knew that I was going to do either this or one of Deedle's examples. I decided on this one, but I did not have a chance to review it in great detail. All right, let's look at how it runs. All right, there we have this. All right, so let me run it. All right, let's look at how it behaves, and then we will. Take a look at the code. I will post this, so we'll talk about this. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about this again on Thursday. All right, the game starts and X's go first and the computer goes first. So the computer chooses the X, all right? So they pick the center, all right? Here's my little difficulty thing that I can slide between easy and hard. So we have it somewhere in the middle there, all right? Now, I'm going to pick this, all right? It picked alongside of it the way that it should. I go to block it. No one wins. It could have won. Why didn't it win? Because I'm in the middle as far as the difficulty setting goes. So effectively, if I, if I remember the code, and we'll verify this, um, wherever you are on the difficulty uh, uh, meter, that's a percentage of times that it makes the right move. So in other words, if I'm smack dab in the middle, 50% of the time I'll make the right move, 50% of the time I'll make the random move. So let's, let's make it hard. All right, we'll do the same thing. The computer's always going first. Yes. And then X wins. All right. Yeah. So I amped up the difficulty, and now the computer will not lose. I stand corrected. Yeah. Maybe I don't have it quite at 100% of the time. I don't know. We'll have to look. Maybe that's a bug. All right, at any rate, let's look at this. What do you suspect the layout is? Table layout, exactly. So let's look at our main XML. And it is a table layout. That consists of how many rows? Well, at least three, plus there is a row on the bottom for the slider. So, a row that has easy, the slide, um, the, the seek bar, and then the word hard. Seek bar for the difficulty, text view, 
for the word easy, the text view for the word hard. We then, each one consists of an image view. And I deliberately name the image view following a convention that when we look at the code, it's going to be clear. All right, why, why I named it that way. Each image is called cell and the row number followed by the column number, starting off with zero. So in other words, the first cell it has an ID of cell zero, zero. The one next to it is cell zero, one, cell zero, two. Cell one zero, cell one one, cell one two, cell two zero, cell two one, cell two two. Pardon me? Kind of like room numbers. But even more rigidly defined because, like in this one, there might not be a room something or other because, like, there's nothing on that side of the hall or something like that. All right, because they skip them, but here I do that. Now, why do you suppose I would do something like that? Let's see if we can, let's see if we can, we can play mind reader here. All right, simple logic, how so? I'm going to use the IDs, I'm going to create the IDs programmatically. In other words, I am going to take and concatenate the word cell with some in integer variables that contain the row and column, like 0, 1, 0, you know, 0, 0, whatever. I'm going to concatenate those with some image, uh, uh, integer variables, and I'm going to generate the ID. And those also correspond to array elements, right? If I was making this a two-dimensional array, then a two-dimensional array is like a table, and then I would have the first group of things, the second group, and then the third group. All right. My values file, nothing exciting there, I don't think. I have my strings with a variety of different strings that you might see, the app name, description of the image, a message if no one wins, a message if X wins, a message if O wins, OK, game over, easy and hard, so all the string literals. Now one thing that you might have noticed is each one of these initially is set to having an image of drawable none. All right. And the drawable none is simply the question mark. All right. So I have a drawable called none, which is a question mark. I then have a drawable for the O and a drawable for the X. I actually made these images. Yeah. Right. Exactly. All right, so let's, let's look at the code. Right off the bat, you can see that maybe I need to do some refactoring because all I have is the activity. I don't have a tic-tac-toe rules object. Now let's think about that a second. In the case of cards, it sort of makes sense to break things out, all right? Because there's a lot of different card games you could play. You could play solitaire, you could play rummy, you could play poker. Play all these things with the same deck of cards. So there's a reusability factor here. Tic-tac-toe is really just tic-tac-toe. So, not to excuse it, but there's probably less of a need to make stuff here reusable. Well, connect four, that's true. That's true. We could, we could, 
We could possibly generalize to tic-tac-toe-like games or even 3D tic-tac-toe. All right. But um, that is one, how do I want to put it? We talked before about having code in the wrong place. That is one argument for not being too obsessed about that if you don't think that the, the code that you're going to have is, is uh, going to lend itself to reusability. All right. So not to excuse myself, but to offer one potential explanation why this isn't as refactored and broken down into objects. All right, let's look at the main activity. All right, we got all our imports. Whose turn I have is a negative one. All right. Move number is zero. I have a value for x and o as one and negative one. I have my two-dimensional array, all right? We're all familiar with an array, right? An array is a list of items that's subscripted, all right? So we don't refer to simply a value of an array. We refer to the value in position 0 or the value in position 1 or so on. A two-dimensional array is the same thing, except you could think of it as a list of arrays. All right. And an array element then is called two dimensional because you have to give two values for it. All right. So let's look at a regular array. A regular array would have if I say I have an array here of A, which is three elements big, then that means that there's an A sub 0, an A sub 1, and an A sub 2. So that's what it means to say there's three values. This is called a one-dimensional array. Because to refer to an element, I give one subscript. All right. It would be like a number line, right? If we have a number line, and let's only consider integers at this point. If I wanted a particular spot on the number line, I just give a single integer saying what spot I'm at. All right. A two-dimensional array, you can think of as needing two numbers to identify. This isn't a straight line, a number line. This would be a table of numbers. So if I say A, 3, 3, you can think of this as being just a list. You can think of this as being 3, a list containing 3 items, but each item in that list also contains 3 items. So we would have A sub 0, 0. A sub 0, 1, A sub 0, 2, A sub 1, 0, A sub 1, 
1 a sub 1 2 finally a sub 2 0 a sub 2 1 and a sub 2 2 all right so to refer to any position any element in this array we have to give two numbers the row and the column all right and we can go from there right we have a three dimensional array and you could think of a three dimensional array as being like an x a y axis and a z axis that went vertically all right to give a to define a point on here would have to give three numbers how far x it is how far y it is and how far up it is so each dimension of an array is an, an extra thing that you an extra number you have to include to give a um, to refer to an element of that array are all what as part of job well they're all arrays all right so um, if I if I make a, an, an array list and make it a certain size then um, or I make an array it, it's still just an array so it's not like there's a two-dimensional array you have to import in fact if we look at this we'll see We don't even make an array list of that. We simply make an array of image views. All right, so we don't even really need to import anything. Why just a plain array and not an array list? kind of and what's true about the tic-tac-toe structure what's the difference between the tic-tac-toe structure and blackjack and your cards how many cards do you have in a blackjack hand in a hand it varies right you could have two cards you'd have three cards you could have four cards so because of that we make an array list because array lists are good when you have a expandable or a non-defined um, list of items so you know you could have two cards in your hand or you could have four cards in your hand or you could have three or five or whatever all right in tic-tac-toe there's only going to be a three by three grid all right therefore I can make that just a plain old array and not an array list all right. Just simplifies things a little bit. All right, that I can I can code it as that. Yeah, that's effectively what this is. This is an array. Uh, this is an array where each element is an array. So a sub zero is actually this first row. All right, a sub one is actually this row, and then so if I refer to a sub zero, I'm referring to an array. A sub one is referring to an array. You can process things that way if you need to. In this case, I believe we process every every time we process it, we look at just a single cell. We don't look at uh, we don't treat an entire row as an array, although we could. Yes. You can, but 
you have to remember what you're asking the size of. All right? Are you asking the size of... Um, if you wanted the total number of elements, um, you could probably do it. Um, you could ask the size of the array, then you could ask the size of array element sub zero, and that would probably give you, and you multiply them together, that would give you how many things are in it. I believe that's how you do it. Our life's a little easier in this case because we know there's, there's exactly three elements here. So we don't have to ask the array how big it is. So if you notice, the way I have that drawn up there, that array drawn up there, it's exactly like the way I call these cells. All right, that cell zero zero. That's the top left corner, and I use the word a zero zero here instead of cell, but that's also the top left corner. Cell zero one is the one that's in the top center. Cell zero one is in the top center, and so on. Okay. So when I create this, I do my typical um, initialization. I go in and I set content view to be my main. I go and create dynamically. All right. I create my array to point to each of the cells in my table view. Now this might get a little confusing. So let's, let's draw this out. I am my GUI. This is my GUI. This is my array in memory. And I call my array IV, image view. So I have IV00, IV01, IV02. IV one zero IV one one IV one two IV two zero IV two one and IV2, 2. These are all going to point. Each one of these is an image view object. It's going to point to, the array is going to point to the image view in the GUI. So this guy is going to point to this one. This guy is going to point to this one. This guy is going to point to this one. And so on down the line. These guys have the name of cell 00, cell 01, cell 02. So I have a 3x3 three three array of image views. What I need to do is make sure each of those elements of the array points to the proper image view in the GUI. All right? I have an array of image views. 
all right, in my code. Now, normally we do something like this to point to something in the GUI. All right, we say skill bar equals seek bar, find view by ID, R skill. All right, I could have done that. I could have made nine separate image views. Image view 00, image view 01, 02. And I could have done a statement that looks like this nine times. But the problem with that is that would make for some very difficult code. All right? If my image views are in an array, then I can process them more easily. All right? For example, I can look to see if everything in the row is an X or an O. If everything in a row is an X or an O, then the game's over. If everything's in a column is an X or an O, then the game's over. All right? So, by having them in an array, it makes my life easier. So instead of making nine separate image views, I'm looping through and I'm creating a 3x3 three three array, I piece together the ID. I have a outer loop and an inner loop. I is going to go from 0 to 3. J is going to go from 0 to 3. And then I piece together the cell name as being cell plus I plus J. So the first time through is going to be cell 0, 0. I then grab the resource ID that corresponds to that string. And I say, find view by ID such and such. So effectively what I'm going to do is IV sub 0, 0 is going to point to cell 0, 0. IV 0, 1 is going to point to cell 0, 1, and so on. Yes? This one? Then I'm looking for an ID. I'm looking for an ID that has this value in this package. IDs are, when the day is done, IDs are simply integers. So I want the integer that corresponds to the ID for the thing that's called cell this plus this. So that will look at cell 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. Then I set on click listener to this. All right? So what does that mean? Okay. All all image views have the same on-click listener. And what is that on-click listener? Well, not the on-create. Right. But what, what is the name of the class that is going to be the on-click listener when I say this? the main class, the activity class. So this main activity, notice it extends activity and it implements on click listener. Pardon me? Yeah, this means whatever class, or I'm sorry, whatever object that code appears in and that is one of these guys. You had your hand up? Well, it's not in a listener, it's on the on create. Okay, so yeah, I'm setting the listener. Ah, I didn't even notice this. This class does a lot. This class serves a role as the on click listener. It also serves a role of, as the on seek bar listener. Can a class 
implement two interfaces? Well, it better, otherwise this wouldn't work, right? You don't use implements multiple times. You just simply say implements, and then you have a list of the classes. Now, what does it mean when I say this class implements on click listener, this class implements on seek bar listener? Right. I have to have all the methods associated with an on click listener, and I have to have all the methods associated with an on seek change listener. Right. You don't necessarily have to do anything with them, but you have to have them there. And if we look, here we have the on click method. So here we've satisfied the contract for it to be an on-click listener. All right. And then here is the stuff that satisfies the contract for being the seek listener. So this class does a lot of things. It's a main activity. It also contains a code that process when the individual cells gets clicked. It also pro has a code to process when the seek bar is chosen. Now one thing I did as a debugging exercise is I put toast in here. I think I, we talked about toast before. Yeah. And what toast will allow me to do, I'll go and uncomment it and I'll put it in is it's a way of showing like a little message and it's particularly good for debugging so I'm going to import the Android widget toast and then I'm going to go in and uncomment out these lines of code and then I'll run it Which little statement? Okay. Yep. Yes. Let, let's let's see the toast, and then then we'll talk about that for a second. Okay. So. I've touched that, all right? I go and move it, doo, 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 and I let go there, and it gives me a message, the new skill level is 93. So, notice the on-click listener code. I don't do anything when I start changing it. I don't do anything when I touch it. I don't do anything when I change it. I only do something when I let go of it, right? There's no sense setting it every time I move it, all right? When I'm done and I'm done dragging it, that's be, that'll be when I finally want to set that. So what am I doing? I grab, I grab the progress from the seek bar, and I set the skill to whatever that progress is. My toast simply creates a message by um, taking the skill level, uh, or... or I'm sorry, uh, defining a skill level message by taking a hard-coded value, um, P2 string, so converting that to a string, and then I say toast, make text, put all this great stuff in here, and it will then go and show that message, pop it up just for a while, hopefully long enough to read it, and then it closes it. So stuff like this is good just to display a little message or something. Like if you were deleting something, uh, in your application, you know, you might want to confirm that the deletion was successful. Or if there was an error that said, hey, you can't delete this, you can't delete this contact because this contact is set as your emergency contact or something silly like that. You could pop up a message that said that. Uh, that that's, you know, the equivalent of like popping up a message box in, in other programming languages. 
But in addition to giving your user little things, little, little pieces of information like that, it's also effective in debugging. You know, you can run a debugger, but sometimes it's just as easy just to throw up a little toast message. All right. Question. We had a question about integer. We'll talk more about this in Java class. Um, but in a nutshell, one problem with primitives is, one of the problems with primitives is that you can't put a primitive in an array list because an array list requires an object. So what if you want to have an array list of integers? Well, there are classes that sort of imitate that. And so for every primitive, if you look the full word spelled out with a capital thing, will be the version of that. There's a process known as boxing and unboxing, where you go in and, for example, I could say, integer x equals 1. Well, I'm setting a value of an object to a primitive. Compiler handles that for you. That's called boxing. The reverse is true, too. I can take an integer and treat it like a primitive. So these sort of funky, I think they're called wrapper classes, uh, that sort of wrap the primitives, um, that sort of allows you the best of both worlds. You can treat it like a primitive, um, but you could also treat it like an object. So you can add it to an array list, but you could use it in a mathematical expression just like it was an int. They at least have a few. They definitely have a two-string method, as we can see here. Um, I'm not sure what other ones. Yes? Yes. So in other words, the whole idea of boxing and unboxing mean, means if I have, if I assign a, a object integer to an int primitive, it takes it and converts it to an object. And if I do the opposite, if I use an integer object in a mathematical expression, it treats it like an integer. Yes. Yeah, primitives are simpler. So primitive, prim, primitives require less resources and don't require object management like, like objects do. Um, additionally, um, they, um, you know, to legacy code. You know, there probably would be some legacy code out there that would break if you got rid of primitives. Uh, and that probably would not make people too happy. That's like the one thing, like when I talk to people about uh, Java, you know, Java is, I think in the textbook they spoof the Ivory Snow commercial and say it's 99 and 44 one hundredths percent object oriented. Primitives are the, the catch, all right? They will keep it from being 100 percent purely object oriented. And it would be a pain not to have them. Uh, there are more purely object-oriented languages like Smalltalk, I think, and Lisp and, and some of those. Um, but, again, it's kind of like an okay compromise. Is value, we could do that. All right, we could we could actually make a um, we could actually have um, a let's talk about that. All right, <laughs> what is this array list? What is each element in this array list? Okay, and what's the data type of it? I think I heard it. It's an image view. All right. Each one of these is an image view. That means that has all the properties and methods associated with an image view. 
All right. You're suggesting in addition to holding the image, we could somewhere hold the state of it. In other words, is it not selected? Is it an X or is it a no? Well, that's kind of already in an image view, isn't it? Already in the image view. What is in the image view that tells us if it's been selected or not selected or an X or no? Pardon me? The, the image itself. So the image itself. We're going to test to see, when we write code here, we're going to test to see if a particular cell has this image in it, the none, the O, or the X. All right, we're literally going to look. It's like, is it an X? Does it have the X image in it? <laughs> then it's an X. All right. Now, to your question, it's not a bad answer because that's a little bit funky. All right. You know, on the funky scale, um, that would be a 23, I think. I mean, it's not like horrible, but it's not necessarily the best coding practice because I'm using a piece of data for one thing that was really meant for something else. The image name is, is, is what's going to be displaying, all right? I shouldn't also use that to keep track of the state, strictly speaking. So what would I do? How would I fix this? Well, one way to fix this would be to have a second array, a second two-dimensional array that contained the state of each cell. And you'd make some convention up, a 0 for a not chosen, a 1 for a uh, an X, a negative one for an O, or something like that. So you could do that. The other thing that you could do is I could make an ancestor, uh, make a subclass of this, and I could call this a tic-tac-toe cell. All right, and that tic-tac-toe cell would inherit from image view. So it would be an image view, but it would be an image view that has some additional things to it. And one of the things it would have would be an integer that says the state of the cell. Okay? So we're actually, I actually do that. We'll probably see an example here where I take the image view and add like a watermark to it. You know, like... Um, you know, like if you were a photographer and you had your image, an Android app that showcased your portfolio, you might want a watermark on it so people don't steal your work, right? Well, do you want to go and edit every one of your pictures to add a watermark to it? Well, yeah, I guess you could, and, and maybe that would be a good idea. But what we could do is we could make an image view subclass that was just like an image view, but Smack dab in the middle of the image view, it puts a watermark. Yes? It, uh, it would be a, a custom view. Yes. Yes. So I could extend image view and, and, uh, and, and then add specific code for, for the stuff that was different. Like in the example of, example of what? Oh, in the example of the watermark one, I actually override, I, have, I add an extra attribute, that is the text that I want the watermark to be. I actually then add in, I override the draw method of the image view to say, hey, Draw the image just like you normally do. So I say super dot draw. All right. Then I go in and I draw the text over top of the image view. So yeah, you, you could extend that. And, and that's a great thing about, and, and this is true, by the way, in any object-oriented environment. You could do the same thing in C Sharp if you wanted to. All right. You could take one of the views that's available in C Sharp um, or controls or whatever they call them, and you could override it to make your, so you could, you could take a text box and create an ancestor of that to be your text box. 
and maybe it's a text box that only allows a certain number of characters to be put in or only allows there to be a part number put in or something like that does some validation um, in the middle of it so you could do something like that and you can extend the framework whole idea of these things is the framework gives you like a um, um, a starting point a jumping off point so you can add your own code to extend that framework and you can even extend the framework to do things specific to what you want to do in in your application so to answer your question yeah the reason I don't need one is I'm gonna cheat and look at the image that's in there all right um, I could either create another array and and have that have the state um, or I could um, create a descendant class, create a subclass from that. Truth be told, what I like about my answer is I'm always going to be consistent, right? I don't have to worry about setting a property that says whether it's an X, Y or not selected and setting an image. Setting an image sets that property. Yet the purest of me says that that's a case of using a piece of data intended for one reason for another reason. All right. Yes. What would you use a three-dimensional array for? The reason a three-dimensional array wouldn't work, by the way, in this case, is because you would be having, you probably could get a three-dimensional array to work, but it wouldn't be a three-dimensional array of, of image views. It would be a three-dimensional array of objects or something like that where two dimensions of the array were image views and one was like an integer or something like that. What, would you, what you'd use an image, uh, a three-dimensional array for is, is if there was um, some situation where three indexes were required to give you a value. So what would be an example of where you would need three indexes to give you um, a value. 3D tic-tac-toe, there you go. <laughs> that would be an obvious one. But even something like you could put tuition rates for students Let me see. Let me think. No, that would, be a, that would still be a two-dimensional array. It would, it would be essentially where a value depended on three factors instead of two factors. So s spatially, definitely, if you're doing a 3D thing versus a 2D thing, um, true. But um, if you... Yeah, you, you, you could do something like that. You could say your tuition depends on, number one, if you're a citizen or an employee. Number two, if you're in county, out of county, or out of state. And three, if you're an undergrad or a graduate. That would be three pieces of information you need to know to get your tuition. So, yeah, that would be, that would be an example of this. Yes? Hmm? Yes. Well, again, anytime you refer to a class, you can do it either way. You can put the import in there, and then you can use a short version, or you could put. Um, whatever it is, android.widget.imageView. I would assume so because you, you actually can, um, you actually can make a class where it doesn't, um, where you're not able to inherit it, right? I think if you declare a class as final, 
um, you can declare classes final. So if, if you can inherit from it, that, I mean, they could keep you from doing that if they didn't want you to. So. Well, well, you're, you're not, I mean, if you're using the framework legally, all right, you can use a framework to the fullest extent. So you certainly couldn't, like, take their code and market it as your own, but as far as extending a class, I don't think that would, that would come into question. Well, one there's a there's a lot of ways that I, I don't I don't remember how you prevent a subclass. You might not be able to do that, but one thing you could definitely do is you could make the methods private. Then the subclass couldn't. I think that would work. I don't know, but the, the bottom line is, yeah, inheriting from it that that should not be an issue. All right, let's see where we were. All right. We actually have gotten to this part, just the on create. And the on create, let's, let's, let's summarize where we are when we're done with this. When we're done with this, we have our variable called skill bar that points to our seek bar. All right? And we've set its listener and we've defaulted its value. We have an, a, a three by three array of image views, which correspond to the image views in the GUI. All right, and we've set the on click listener to each of those. This class itself is the on click listener for and, and the the seek bar listener for the seek bar and for each one. The last thing we have is I think I have initialize board, and you can almost guess what that does. That simply loops through all clearboard. That simply loops through all the images and sets the image to none. And calls the method before, below it setting that is the computer's move or making the computer's first move. Initializes the move number back to zero. It sets whose who's turn to, Z, uh, to X. Wipes out the board and then does computer move. One thing I forgot. I cheated a little bit to set image resource essentially is the property which determines the state of it. So that's what I use. And we'll talk about that next time. I'll put this code up here between now and then if you want to take a look at it. You're welcome to. Uh, we'll pick up with this. Now, some of these things are confusing, and some of these things are outside of the realm of specifically Android. For example, the, the two-dimension array. There's two-dimensional structures in, in any programming language. So um, I'm trying to go over this, again, just to expose you to a different, you know, different sorts of programming examples. All right. Questions? All right. That's all I had for today.